Um, thank everybody for coming. This panel is on distribution strategies. Uh, every year we talk about distribution strategies. Every year we complain about distribution <laughs> strategies. Uh, we're going to attempt to not make this a venting <laughs> session, which no would be all too easy to do. Um, instead, we have a little bit of maybe a, an interesting format here. What we're going to do is I'm going to give a little bit of an intro, then I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, I want you to be thinking about this framework. Dan, hi Dan, Dan from Filament Games, he has a decision to make right now in terms of a distribution strategy. At the end of this, you all are going to vote to tell him what to do. <laughs> Whatever you tell him, that's what he's yeah. going to do, so it better be good. <laughs> the future of Filament Games depends on you. Um, how are you going to make that decision for him? You're going to hear from Robin, who's going to give you one approach that she is currently executing on, what's working and not working about that. You're going to hear from Noelle, who's going to give you a different approach and how that's working or not working for her company. Dan is going to ask whatever questions he wants to ask. He's going to give you some information on the decision he's trying to make, how he generally goes about that decision-making process. We're going to open it up to all of you, and you're going to get to ask questions about Robin's strategy, Noelle's strategy, what exactly Dan is trying to, what are you trying to prove, Dan? Uh, what exactly Dan is trying to do. Yeah, that's one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and we're going we're gonna to have a lively discussion about that. And then what I'll try to do is distill, you know, based on what you're saying, we'll try to distill it down into maybe one or two or three, I mean, not just one, that wouldn't work, two or three directions that Dan might be able to go in, and then we're going to vote, and then you're going to let us know in a year how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Next year. So, so the panel is distribution right. strategies, don't listen to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> or listen, who knows? <laughs> we're a little punchy. It's the end. Uh, okay, so before we get into that, I'm just, I want to try to give you a little bit of lay land. I'm sure most of you already know this, but I'm I'm legally obligated to give you this introduction. So um, mm -hmm. why, why are we talking about this every single year for 10 years? Well, because there's a problem. And the problem is that relevant content is really hard to find in the current distribution platforms, right? So just a couple of things to note would be, based on the research, and if you really want to know the citations here, I'll, I'll give them to you. 55% um, of parents, 80% of teachers can't find what they're looking for. That's what they tell us in survey after survey. 30 million children live in low-income families. They lack access to relevant content. They just can't even get to it. Um, and content producers face significant challenges to sustainability. Is there anyone in this room who's a content producer who does not feel that sustainability is a challenge? <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> it's a really big challenge. Um, so why is it such a challenge? Well, one of the things we look at is the user journey. The user journey on the K-12 side is very different than the user journey on the at-home parent consumer side, right? So this is just broad strokes, but the user journey for somebody in a school might be how do they get their ideas from colleagues, from conferences, from associations, they search app stores, right? A variety of ways. Um, then once they get those ideas, they say, all right, well, which one of these is going to be relevant to the kids I serve? What's going to work on the device that I have? Um, is it going to be worth my time and money? How do they figure that out? Well, they got to go get information in a variety of places. Maybe they go to Common Sense, maybe they go to Google, they go to product review sites, here, there, and everywhere. And then the path sort of splits a little bit, whether they're an administrator who has direct access to a budget, or they're an educator who may or may not have direct access to a budget, right? Maybe they have a little bit of money in their pocket they're willing to spend. Maybe they don't or cost more than that, and they have to influence the purchasing decision at their school, so that kind of depends. And depending on who they are and where they're buying this thing, then you know, the path branches off again. And then eventually they have to try to actually download it <laughs> and see if it works. And that's a whole other branching tree, depending on the device, their IT support, their bandwidth, all kinds of things, right? So um, I like pulling out this quote because it annoys me a little bit. <laughs> that is that Ed Zerg said, uh, decisions about the particular tools, features, functionalities occur on such a one-off basis that vendors are rarely pressured in a single direction by the whole of the market. That's true, but I would also say, well, it's not just that the vendors aren't, you know, doing their best, right? I mean, you all are vendors. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult situation, um, which we can all agree on. Um, user journey on the parent-consumer side, this is a chart by our dear friend Bjorn Jeffrey, who used to run the company Tokoboka. Um, and he, if you're not following him, he is an independent consultant now. I'm going to do a little plug for Bjorn. He's got a blog and he's covering a lot of these issues in a really smart way. Um, so I stole this from him. Um, 
but he looks at the spectrum of kids and wh what the level of parental influence is and what the level of parental knowledge is over the decisions of um, the apps and games that kids are using at home, right? And so Bjorn says, there is supply and there is demand in this space, but they're not meeting each other. Um, the market is between other markets, and basically it needs to grow up as a market. And until it grows up as a market, we're all gonna be trying to find our little tricks. Um, why do we even care? Why don't we just give up? <laughs> why don't we just give up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was less likely to give up on day one. Um, uh, why don't we just give up? Well, we don't give up because at this moment in time, we have been talking about this for a long time, some of us longer than others, but this is a very different moment than it was a couple years ago. Access has never been greater. Demand has never been stronger. Supply has never been better. Really, I mean, I hesitate to say this in a room full of people, but I've been doing this since 1998. And it's really never been better. It has really never been better. And it's incredibly exciting and thrilling and it's also even more frustrating because <laughs> I've never heard more parents and teachers say we're hungry for this kind of thing and developers making more that I think is really fantastic. I mean really thoughtful and evidence-based and beautiful and lovely and with kids in mind and all these kinds of things. So that's why, that's why it's worth even having this conversation. Right? Why is it so hard? Many reasons. Um, but a couple of the reasons are, if you look at the current distribution platforms, they kind of fall into three categories or distribution strategies. You've got the App Store and Google Play. It's just a haystack, right? I mean, it's a mess. Let's not even talk about that. Then you've got these niche platforms. Um, Glass Lab attempted to be a niche, niche platform. Teacher Gaming, I would call a niche platform. Um, uh, K-12 publishers present niche platforms, right? Um, but there are a lot of barriers to developers in those platforms, and there's not a lot of choice. So it doesn't replace what consumers are currently doing now, which is Googling, going to iTunes, right? It doesn't, it's not enough to solve the problem. Um, and your alternative as a developer is to sell directly to consumers, right? Whether that's teachers as consumers or parents as consumers. And all of these folks will attest that that is really hard. That requires a sales team and marketing dollars and significant efforts that as an independent developer, um, it's really difficult, right? So that's why it's so hard. I just want to highlight two quick slides. Um, these are posted as part of a story on gamesandlearning.org. Um, that's uh, the organization that I founded that has now, uh, is now a separate organization from what we're currently doing, which is a gamesandlearning.co, but we still have a special place in our heart for the .org. <laughs> And they um, recently released um, some survey results from work that uh, we've all done with First Book. First Book is a network of 425,000 educators all serving low-income communities. And we asked them these same questions over the course of time so we can see how they change year over year. Um, so this one's just something to note. What are the main reasons why they, your digital learning resources don't help you meet your objectives? What do they say? They say, they always say this. They always say there's not enough budget. Um, but they also say lack of functioning devices, and they say I don't have enough class time to incorporate the tool into my work, right? So that's, what, that's, the, that's the bad news. The good news is, comparing this year to last, how would you describe the use of digital learning resources in your classroom or program? And this is hard to read here. Oh, I see. 59% um, use them more often this year than they did last year. Uh, only 5% use them less often this year than they did last year. Right? So if we look at this in a variety of ways, it's all going like this. That's the good news. Um, so we're going to shift now into the panel discussion. And remember, you all have a job to do. Uh, three considerations while you're listening to these strategies and while you're thinking about how you're going to advise Dan. What are the best distribution opportunities for your specific products, target audience, and purpose? If you don't start with that, you're really nowhere, right? One, what's gonna work? Robin's gonna explain a strategy that likely wouldn't work for what Noelle is gonna describe. What, they're, what they found that has worked, you will see is, is very specific to the product and the audience that they're trying to serve. Um, what's the business model and price point that fit with the specific expectations and needs of that audience and purpose, right? So if you're developing something for a third grade science teacher, that comes with expectations for what they should have to pay and what they're going to get for what they're paying. If you're developing something that is an at 
home reading app for preschoolers, what does a parent expect to pay and what do they expect to get in return for paying that based on the other things that they're using for a similar purpose? And then three, once you've figured that out, what are the platforms, partnerships, marketing strategies that are gonna get you the highest ROI? And that's different than saying, what are the things you should try? So there are a long list of things you can try in all of those categories. Some of them give you more bang for your buck, right? Some of them require thousands of hours of staff time and headache and maybe don't result in actually helping you pursue your distribution strategy and others maybe low investment and potentially high return. So that's something to consider. Um, in lieu of normal bios here, what we're gonna do is introduce each one of our panelists with um, their uh, product videos. So first, uh, this is Noelle Milholt, and she is the Chief Revenue Officer co-founder <coughs> at Begin, which are the producers of Homer Learning. You may also know her from Speakaboos. When kids learn to read, they unlock a world of imagination, exploration, and learning. Built by learning experts, Homer Reading is the proven learn-to-read program for kids 2 through 8. At Homer, we know that every child learns in uniquely personal ways, so we put personalization in everything we do. We start with your child's age and current reading level, then we add their interests and passions to create a learning plan unique to them. From the moment they start, your kids will be having fun, but all the while they'll be learning to read step by step from ABC's the letter D to practicing phonics Kerr. Kerr. to learning sight words A and D to reading their first book it is you Sam and exploring a world of interests an independent study proved that 15 minutes of Homer reading a day can boost early reading scores by 74% your child will fall in love with reading on Homer reading When kids learn to read, they unlock a world of imagination. Explore uh, <laughs> You're going to hear more about that for now in just a minute. Uh, Robin Yang is right here, is the Senior Product Manager at Code Combat. So let's hear a little bit from Code Combat. Well, it used to be in computer science that coding was a very abstract subject, very difficult to teach the students, and they would not be engaged. And that's not how it has to be. It should be like learning a language. It should be like learning drawing. It should be, it's creative. Code Combat allows teachers to show every student that this is for them, that they can be good at it, and they can be pros at computer science. Code Combat for us has really taken our coding to a different level. It, it's just been a big knockout thing. I love how you have the assessments and the rubrics in there. That's what I love about Code Combat, because it's a nice little package that makes my life easier. It's really nice just to, you know, work with everything and then, you know, being able to maybe like someday grow up and put more women into this field. Like me, I'm going to use this in the future if I want to pursue what I want to do. So I want to be a mechanical engineer. So I said coding is going to help that. They can make games, they can make websites, they can apps. That real project-based learning is so much fun for the kids and the parents love to see it as well. I wanted to make something different because like everybody else is like making mazes and stuff and then I thought capture the flag. Kids don't really even realize that they're learning because they're just playing the game but actually they're learning to go. Everybody loves playing video games. Games are perfect and that's what's so nice about Code Combat. I give it to them and they just go. Students can create whatever they want with real code and Code Combat lets teachers show students that in a way that reaches everybody. And I like how it builds the concepts up slowly so you don't even notice that it's getting harder. It uses some responsibility, it teaches them to learn to do things for themselves. In front, in front. Really nice to see each student just express themselves any way that they want with their code. They love it. I mean, this is their favorite class. <laughs> it feels really cool because I could be doing this when I grow up. Code Combat's a really fun game and you should try it. Ha, ha, ha. 
So, okay. so basically, we're we're trying to um, create an experience that can either augment or add as an act as an on ramp to a physical robotics kit experience. Okay. All right. So remember, your task is to hear what Robin has to say. She's going to give us a few bullet points on her current strategy. Hear what Noelle has to say. She's going to give us a few bullet points. Dan's going to brief us on his conundrum. And then we're going to open it up for questions to probe further. Make sense? Robin, tell us about, tell us about your winning distribution strategy <laughs> at Code Combat. <laughs> so as you can see, a lot of really wonderful student testimonials. Um, it's been a pretty interesting journey to get here. Uh, we are a product that uh, is web-based, um, web-based uh, game that teaches computer science to middle schools and high schoolers, and so we are distributing directly into classrooms. We have a full sales team, and so that lets us reach um, a pretty interesting network of distributed target states. It lets us keep up with curriculum standards um, that are getting adopted, and so for us, um, three years ago when I started there, when we started pivoting this product from what was at the time just a home consumer product into the classroom, we heard a lot from teachers about their need for this kind of product. I think we were riding a wave of computer science getting adopted in the classrooms, but with a lot of teachers that had no idea what they were doing. Um, we would hear stories about um, from technology leads saying things like, you know, we really, really want to get more STEM in our curriculum. We want to build some pathways for computer science learning. We know that it's really important to get early exposure so that they have an opportunity to consider computer science as a, um, a degree when they get to college. But we have no idea what to do. You know, computer scientists, we can't hire people who have CS degrees as teachers. They make far more money in Silicon Valley. What do we do? Um, and so we had this kind of t uh, typical case study that we would use, which was, um, which came from a real story, which is that there was a choir teacher who drew the short straw that year to teach the computer science elective. And so in the back of my mind, I'm like, how do I set that teacher up for success? How do I te teach the teacher? enough about computer science and then build a platform that's engaging enough that they don't have to worry about engaging the students. All they have to do is be there to help them troubleshoot. Not just to facilitate, like I want the teachers to be very, very involved in the content, but we meet them where they are, right? We don't expect them to be able to have procured professional development funding or to know how to spend time online researching all the various options. We want to have it be a one-stop shop for them. Um, so that uh, governed a lot of our early product strategies, was thinking about how do we meet the teacher where they are when, again, it could be this choir teacher that drew the short straw. Right? We obviously had a lot of other um, early adopters in our space who were uh, CS teachers who had been trying to push for STEM adoption for a very long time that were eager to see uh, competitors like us kind of come onto the scene and help engage their students. Um, but we really wanted to actually meet uh, our early adopter group, which was teachers who knew in their network, in their school, in their district that they needed to be able to teach a subject but had no idea where to start. Um, so that informed a lot of our early product strategy, um, and it was kind of uh, matched with, um, we're kind of a more of a like Silicon Valley startup type, and so we were able to build up um, a sales team, and what I did early on was make my sales team my research team, because <laughs> I knew that they were the ones who were actually going and talking to the customers every single day, so I actually taught them how to ask research questions, because you know, inevitably a salesperson comes to me, they're like, Robin, this teacher really wants this button. I'm like, what does the button do? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Right, so helping them with design thinking, helping them with design research, um, and I essentially grew my sales team into my research team, and so ended up with a really, really great collaborative relationship between our teams that ended up being a great pipeline for teachers to voice their concerns and have them directly addressed into our product. Um, I just talked for a lot. Tell me about some other things I can That's highlight. That's okay. So <laughs> let's talk your distribution strategy. Yes. So you sell to whom at what price point and yes. how? So many questions. Um, we sell to many people at very many price points. Um, <laughs> but we actually, um, our strategy depends on kind of rolling out pilots. So we know that our product is strongest when we, when we have student engagement first, right? And that means the teachers see the impact. The teachers see, oh my gosh, my students are so excited about this game. You heard it in the in the video. My, my, this is my student's favorite class. They don't even realize they're learning. They think they're just playing a video game. That's where we want to be the whole time, right? And so if we can, if we start at the district level, right? If we go to a district administrator and give them kind of stats, they don't see that magic. They don't see that advocacy and evangelism coming from the teacher. So we knew that we had to start at the student and teacher level, right? Which is making a product that engages students first and foremost, and then making sure the teachers understand what that engagement means, right? Making sure that they're not just having fun with the game, here are their actual learning outcomes, mm -hmm. making sure those are actually clear. We developed that into a feature called Outcomes Reports, um, which actually rolls up all the stats from all the teachers classrooms into a PDF that they can just go and give to their principal or give to their school administrator. And so that ends up being our pathway through actually talking to the stakeholders at a district level. Mm -hmm. Are you charging schools? Are you charging classrooms? Are you charging individual teachers? Are, do, you pay, do you charge by seat? 
we or by do class? we kind of do different uh, different uh, pricing models depending on the particular place so in some schools they don't have a full kind of support curricular uh, for a bunch of um, technology supports we have to find our way into budgets so it's an interesting time in computer science specifically because there are some states that have adopted computer science as a requirement there are other states where it's just piecemeal right where it's like oh it's just one elective here or there um, and the strategy that we've adopted is just like we look we want everyone to have this so we're kind mm -hmm. of going to meet you where you are so in some cases that means you know a really low cost pilot in exchange for a lot of research data that we partner mm -hmm. with you on in other cases it is like a whole district rollout mm -hmm. Okay, I think we pause there because Dan's going to think of questions he wants to ask you here in a minute. Um, in case there's anything that's not clear uh, about the strategy. Um, Noelle, can you tell us a little bit about what's working for yeah. Homer? Yeah, so um, Homer Learning, our uh, mission is to give children the best educational start possible. And that starts with preparing them both for school and for life. So we focus on early childhood skills-based um, content around reading, as you saw. We're going to be branching out into math. Uh, early childhood coding as well, as well as social emotional topics. Um, we're a subscription service and um, we are direct to consumer, so the opposite uh, strategy uh, to start out with. And one interesting point was at, at, at a certain point we, we did hire a salesperson from Pearson onto the team, really talented, did his best, made a few sales, but we, we hadn't designed the product for school specifically and it was difficult and, and we can't do many things really well. So we decided to hold on that strategy. Uh, right now we're viewing um, school to home or teacher to home as an organic awareness strategy, which is one of the hardest nuts to crack for any business, is how do you get parents sharing this, hearing about it, talking about it. We did research early on that found, you know, how do parents hear about them, something? Obviously teachers, right? So how do we go to the watering holes where we know families are? Um, the other part of the strategy was what I oversee as Chief Revenue Officer is partnerships. So that has been a huge growth lever for us outside of paid marketing uh, partnerships. And what that looks like is working with um, partners that have a large reach, um, marketing budgets, um, and teams on the ground internationally um, that want to work with us because we're flexible, we're able to customize our pro program for them, we are educational and they don't have an educational uh, background and they're not educational experts. Um, a few examples of that are one of our first partners with the largest educational publisher in Korea, a company called Kyoan, and um, they actually invested in our company and also gave us budget to build specific stories for them that were for early childhood, like the earliest childhood uh, English language learning, which was wonderful. We got to use that content for our audiences here as well. Mm -hmm. And we got to tell the story of this partner uh, in that market that has now opened up uh, other partners in India and, and Asia Pac. In this well. level, you get to see a preview of advanced heroes and abilities available to subscribers <laughs> in later stages <laughs> of That's exciting. There's a lot more happening on your screen, um, but don't let that confuse you. Yeah, and as I, these one, <laughs> where are they going? What you need to do is make your way to is the right the of the I think one other now. thing to mention, just to run Start out. off by moving twice. Um, one of the critical things for, for our growth, at least from a paid marketing perspective, that was um, important is that we are proven. There's a lot of claims out there that uh, apps are educational. Uh, parents want to see that it's proven. And so that efficacy study we did that was done by Dr. Susan Newman uh, at NYU um, proved that with 15 minutes a day, reading scores in increased. And of all the creative we've tried on Facebook, on commercials, that has always been the most successful. It's what parents click on. Um, it's, it's just a way they can filter. Um, we actually are going to be doing another research study uh, around efficacy as well. So everything we do has to be proven. Um, our model, as I mentioned, is consumer subscription. We're $7.99 now a month. Uh, you get access to two apps, a, a Learn to Read library as well as a Love to Read library of stories. And we're going to be launching, as I mentioned, a math app, um, a physical component as well that kids are going to get in the mail, um, all for likely under $10. So the idea is to provide overwhelming value and really um, not go the individual app strategy because that's mm -hmm. really hard. Yes. Uh, thank you, Noah. One quick question. Where would you place the company on a trajectory of sustainability in terms of the revenue that you're able to generate? Um, do you feel like uh, you're sustainable now? The revenue is supporting the operation? you have sustainability in your sites, or it has to be a longer term goal? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, right? I think we are sustainable now. Um, our profit margin is really high because we're digital, which is great. Um, but paid advertising is, is getting harder and harder. Mm. And we can't just rely on them. We have an amazing paid marketing team. Um, 
some channels, in case you guys are interested, that have done particularly well, obviously social media, but that's cyclical. So this quarter was pretty rough, actually. We, we started spending internationally. Mm -hmm. um, so our Android app is being updated as we speak. Yeah, right. um, but yeah, I think partnerships are critical, although we don't put them in our model, because partners are difficult. They take a long time. We don't know how much attention they're going to put on us. Uh, we, we, we signed a deal with Fisher Price, we're signing a deal with Fisher Price this week, hopefully, uh, for the US that took three years. Um, and then we have other partners that contact us and there's a deal in within six months. So you, you never really know them, know that. Um, but the more you can leverage, there's no silver bullet, basically. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> As you all know. Uh, right. Um, thank you, Noel. Uh, okay, Dan, do you want to describe your, your current sure. situation? Yeah, so actually, can I start with a philosophical statement? Okay. It's actually, okay. <laughs> so here, here's the thing, when I think about distribution strategies, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that it can be very difficult to tease apart the difference between whether or not a distribution strategy is working or you have product market fit, right? So mm -hmm. you could have a great product for the wrong market and have the best distribution strategies possible and it's not gonna move the needle, right? So. Our first experience taking a product, in this case, into K-12, which was a library of middle school science games funded by that handsome gentleman in the back corner there from the Department of Education. <laughs> He's giving out free money. <laughs> so <clears throat> the big thing that we learned, and, and again, it's always hard to tell if it's distribution strategy or product market fit, so these are all hypotheses. Take them with a grain of salt. But we were selling core subject area games at middle school, and I think that there's absolutely a market for core subject games, namely the, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, in K-5, uh, where you have a teacher who has a, a mandate to make sure that these kids have a certain level of literacy, both mathematics and, and reading, by the end of fifth grade, and they have ready access to tablets, and there's tons of great content. There's also tons of crap content, obviously, as well, but you get up to middle school and high school and the number of games that are available for education is much, much, much smaller. And a big part of that is because those teachers are now on this march, usually toward a standardized test. They've got a whole crap load of content that they've got to jam into that semester. And our pitch as game-based learning people is basically, your kids are gonna absolutely love this, but it's gonna, you're gonna have to learn something new. It's gonna take a ton of time. It's gonna take more time, right? Because to do something well, you usually take more time. Uh, and it's not necessarily the best test prep. We're gonna nail conceptual understanding, but like it's not necessarily about getting them to do better on a scantron sheet. It's not the greatest sales pitch once you get up to that level, right? So, so the rules of the game start to change. At this point, as you saw with the game that we put up on the screen earlier, it's a game about robotics. Now we're thinking more, what are the peripheral subject areas that we can be hitting in middle school and high school where A, uh, they're, they're not on this sort of death march to a test and have more time to experiment with different types of pedagogies. Um, and B, they're underserved because like people have been making math and science and ELA and social studies products since the dawn of time, whereas for coding or robotics or these sort of like emerging literacies, uh, there's just not nearly as many product solutions. So all that is to say, um, start, I think, by thinking about product market fit before you start thinking about distribution strategies. Now, our previous distribution strategies were we actually built a sales team. Um, and we had our marketing team act as sort of the artillery to, to soften the leads up, and then we'd send the sales team charging in. Um, and what we ultimately found was, as a small company with a relatively small product, that was kind of a non-starter. We could make money, but not necessarily enough to have a margin on top of all of our expenses, so we kind of turned more toward licensing and distribution partnerships, which is ultimately a smaller amount of money, but much higher margin. Um, so that brings us kind of current, right? Mm -hmm. So now I have all these questions for the robotics <laughs> pro project about whether we should focus our energy on consumer versus institutional. If we go institutional, do we focus more on peripheral, out of school, sort of maker spaces, library spaces, um, uh, uh, you know, or, or do we really sort of uh, try to push into uh, electives and coding classes and, and try to stay more core? So um, you're all going to figure this out for me by the end of this session. For those of you who are arriving late, um, I'm kind of crowdsourcing my business plan. <laughs> uh, so you're all culpable uh, by attending this session. And uh, we're going to figure this out.
Uh, thank you, Dan. Yeah. So I'm thinking before, while everyone's thinking about what their questions are, I think maybe Robin and Noel should each think of one thing you want to ask Dan. If this was, if RoboCo was your product <laughs> and you were trying to figure out your strategy, what's, what's something that you need to know from Dan before yeah. you could figure out what that is? Well, there's something that I wanted to add on to when you were talking about how it's difficult in um, middle school and high school to really uh, think about what products appeal to that market. I would say that um, kind of a corollary here, which I think might be interesting to this audience, is that I think the sophistication of the product actually has to go up as you get to middle school and high school because sure. the student expectation for what is a game is actually a lot higher. Um, that's I think there is um, I think there's a, a kind of a gulf in teacher understanding potentially between what is um, a digital interactive uh, platform that provides encouragement and feedback and uh, differentiation and what is a game, right? In, in the sense that like we kind of here understand the discipline of game design. Um, and I think that that gulf is, gets more and more important to, to help, help teachers understand as they get to middle school and high school where the students have a much more sophisticated understanding of what is a game, right? They can tell a difference between like a fun interactive platform that gives you stars for a thing versus something that feels like Fortnite, right? Um, I'm not saying that like we should all go out and build Fortnite for, um, for education, but I think that there, that is an understanding there that I think as game designers in this space um, is useful to think about as we think about what is appropriate for that particular older market. Um, so in that vein, tell us about this robotics product and what are the things that you're thinking about from a, from a kind of design standpoint. From a what standpoint? Design standpoint. Oh, from a design standpoint. Yeah, so it's a maker product, so it's really all about putting the agency in the hands of the students, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a, always a challenge from the perspective that more traditional classes are structured with the idea that the teacher is providing the direction, whereas here we want the um, we want the students to be providing the direction, right? So, so I think from a from a distribution perspective, uh, there there are a number of ways that that can play in. One is one is that uh, you can go directly to the student if ultimately you feel like the student is the person that you're trying to empower in the equation, which would be a vote for consumer. Um, uh, versus, uh, you know, the, the the obvious barrier there, which is the consumer market is incredibly noisy. Uh, the bar for barrier, or the bar of entry is very high, um, and if you're going to play in that market, your game. Um, I don't know how to say this nicely, but yeah, I mean, your game can't look like a lot of games look like when they go into the school market. Right, because it competes for attention. It's very right. diplomatic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's some word salad. Right. Um, Noel, what would you want to ask Dan? Yeah, and again? this is from our experience. Um, I think early on, one of our first hires was a director of marketing, and we were between two candidates, one with a rich brand experience and one with rich paid experience. We went with the, we went with the paid guy, um, which you know he was able to effectively spend. But I think one one regret is that not nailing down our brand and what is our unique value proposition for our unique audience, and the same thing goes for a school or teacher, um, is critical because there is so much out there. So I would really ask about what is your moat, what is your brand, how do you know that, who is your target persona, uh, where are they, um, and, and how does that change, and how do you think about that, not just in the U.S., but um, globally um, in, the, in the long term, because, you know, you know where the numbers are at, um, China, right? So, um, how are you? How are you? And how are you building a product that can pivot to those those audience? I, I'm not familiar with those teenage years for acquisition, but how do you acquire that custom that customer if it was direct to consumer or, uh, yeah, what would that strategy be? Sure. Yeah. So for direct to consumer, we so it's 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 actually really disorienting, and there's a lot of reasons why people will say either focus on the consumer market or focus on the EDU market. Over on the consumer side, you can either self-publish or you can work with a publisher. We're in the process of courting publishers right now who, I mean, it's fair to say if your distribution strategy on the consumer side is to try to reach the largest audience possible, uh, then a lot of people just sign up with a publisher and let the publisher do the work. Technically, you can do that on the EDU side. You have your McGraws and your Pearsons instead of your Ubisofts or you know, uh, your, your consumer publisher, but similar model. Um, I, think, I think for us, uh, because we are a sandbox game, the big question in a sandbox game is typically position software as service, right? So you launch maybe like early access and then you uh, try to build a community and then you keep feeding that new community new content mm -hmm. over the course of their engagement with the game, um, which actually isn't that dissimilar mm -hmm. from a subscription model in yeah. school. Um, or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you're the out of school. Subscription, mm -hmm. I should be pointing at you. Subscription <laughs> model in school. <laughs> um, or a subscription model to parents, but of course comes with the onus of continually feeding that community new content to keep them engaged. Uh, the difference is on the consumer side, 
uh, we can't keep asking them for more money because they've already purchased the game and uh, it's understood that games uh, outside of um, in the institution or outside the institutional market market are perpetuity purchases, right? Um, unless we're going to do microtransactions or basically sell hats or, or things like that. Um, so I would I would say that's a consideration for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, who has a question for any of the panelists that will help Dan sort this out? Yes. Uh, so I is the word game a bad word to say around some of the institutions? Like if you were going to try to sell your product, is game a trigger word? <laughs> Interactive digital experience. Yeah, no, it's, I think it, at least from my experience, it really depends on the institution. Uh, but it doesn't seem like it's, it, it was really problematic 10 years ago. I don't feel like it's that problematic anymore. Do you think of Rebel Co as a game? Yes. I think as long as you can tie it again to like defining what the learning outcomes are, whether it's for institutions or consumers, being clear about that and how it's proven is, is critical. Yeah. I actually think the problem is less whether or not you use the word game and more the fact that game can mean so many different things and that and that's contributing to the problem of consumers, particularly on the institutional side, not having literacy about what, what games mean when on one hand a game can be a drill and skill app that drills numeric literacy and multiplication or something. On the other hand, you could use civilization in a classroom, mm -hmm. right? So two very different experiences. I'd point out that there is a kind of global difference. Um, we have a China team and we have a China business operations team that goes out and distributes to training schools in China that are interested in getting coding into the curriculum. And in that market, we actually do have to downplay the game aspect quite a bit because um, the government has quite a strict set of rules about what they're allowed to adopt as curriculum from a culture standpoint. Um, so it's definitely a global consideration. Jessica, you have a question? Yeah, have any of you guys uh, looked into a market focused on community-based organizations or like after-school clubs or things like that, YMCA's, YWCA's, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Are you saying that's what I should do? No, I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> it's an innocent question. Yes. <laughs> question. We have, um, we partner with Code Ninjas here in the US and they have a facility of after-school training programs for students um, and so they use uh, code combat as part of their curriculum and then we do uh, we I think for folks like boys and girls club they're quite site specific and so they kind of come through our pipeline like any other kind of potential uh, user of ours mm -hmm. yeah we um, we partner with uh, Jim Breed there's our only childhood learning center Jim Breed playing music we're actually designing a, a curriculum that they can use in the classroom and again they part they're like they like us because we're literacy experts and we're digital experts and that's adding to their catalog to drive conversion to their to their schools, so that's one example. Um, Dan, what's your like long vision for this? Is it always going to be digital games, or do you also see like a hands-on maker component to it eventually? Yeah, I mean, I would love it if eventually you could print your own robots out of the game. Um, and I said that to the engineers, and I, I think he was just about to punch me. But I also want multiplayer, and I, you know, I have I have big ambitions for the product that are very difficult to realize from an engineering perspective. But I think ultimately, yeah, it's a it's a community first and foremost, just like it is with real robotics. I think the challenge with real robotics is uh, to participate in that community. Oftentimes, the bar is very high financially and in other ways as well. So we're just trying to see if through digital means, we can lower that bar. Mm -hmm. Over here, this question. Go ahead. Uh, have you explored the possibility of partnering with organizations that organize like, statewide, national, student robotics competitions uh, to mm -hmm. build platforms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So like FIRST and VEX and, the, and yeah, those guys. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, as far as I can tell, they've started thinking a little bit about. Uh, so, th so let me try to generalize this. I think the, the general strategy there would be sort of who are the associations or players who care about a particular subject area uh, that are already doing good work in or around schools and can they be allies from a distribution perspective? And I think absolutely, that's, that's a really good strategy, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've actually used Code Combat once before mm -hmm.
our subject area, um, there's no standardized testing for computer science just right. yet, and so that makes it quite difficult. But there are different frameworks for standards, like CSTA and um, the K-12 frameworks. Um, and there's also stuff like the, um, the Advanced Placement um, Computer Science Principles course that offers a framework for getting schools to a place where they can set students up to take that class and eventually potentially receive college credit for those things. Um, and so we do focus on making sure that our, we are targeting learning outcomes, um, learning objectives that come from these standards, making sure that teachers know about them in our curriculum, um, and try to cover them as fit efficiency as possible, right? Like it doesn't serve the teachers that well if we're only focused on, say, like one specific to just programming when they're being expected to teach their curriculum that encompasses things like um, networking, global, uh, global data security, and things like that, collaboration, coordination. Um, so I think that that is, it goes hand in hand with how we approach our content design is thinking about the um, curriculum that we support. And, and Noelle, you mentioned on the parent side, you mentioned the Susan Newman study mm -hmm. uh, and the marketing output of that yeah. is, is influential for you. Can you just describe the the nature of that study yeah. and sort of the level yeah. of investment you had to make in that study? It was a big investment. <laughs> and we did it for Speak of Booth's Homer Stories as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a double blind randomized study. And you know the advertisers ask us because you is this has this been vetted and they ask for the research report and it's all published on our website. Advertisers ask you for that? Yeah. Sometimes. Really? Sometimes they want yeah, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Like an FTC yeah. thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, because we're saying that we're going to increase your child's reading well, scores. Yeah, I didn't so. think they would care if it yeah. was actually true or not, though. No, they, yeah. It's good that they care. I said that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great um, that they care. Mm -hmm. If any of you are in the room, I'm really glad that you care. That's great. Yeah. Wow. But I think one, so that's obviously, it's all about credibility, right? So credibility with the consumer, credibility with institutional sales. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have certain uh, partners that, you know, for example, I reached out to Delta Airlines. My mom was a flight attendant where I was like, hey, like, we'd love to give you a selection of our content for free on your, on your, in flight, they want educational content. They don't just want the animated cartoons. We're now on every Delta flight. It's free advertising, right? Mm -hmm. And now when I call Air France, they're like, oh, you're on Delta? Okay, like, they weren't in French, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. But um, things like that, like once you get one partner or one advisor, mm -hmm. um, one of our early advisors was a woman named Dr. Alice Wilder. She was co-creator of um, Super Y and head of research development for Blue's Clues. And, you know, just, saying her name, not only recruiting our team, but in, in driving partnerships and driving investment, mm -hmm. um, it makes a, a big difference. So, you know, there's other validation things you can do. It's, it's validation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a unique distribution strategy. You expose people to it on the plane, and then they disseminate knowledge about it wherever they're going. Yeah. Ambassadors. <laughs> 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 only better. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. So many questions, and we've got, like, two minutes. Go ahead. Um, I just have a sort of quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I come from the world of documents. For libraries, specific, for libraries specifically. For libraries, like if you were to license like a virtual reality game to a library mm -hmm. or to an educational institution, versus if you're selling directly to the consumer, what the price difference is. Yeah. And so is there a special license? For site license. Yeah. Site license. Yeah. yeah, and we we do that as well. We created a kiosk version for libraries um, and an institutional version of the product. And what is the difference in price between that and your consumer price? It's a lower. It's a bulk price per student, so um, it ranges anywhere from a dollar to however. Much you just look at comps in the marketplace. Um, we are one ninety nine per student, um, up to a certain usage. Um, we're seven ninety nine per family per month, and one ninety nine per year. Yeah, so they get a heavy discount. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, do you have a price point for libraries? Um, we work on sliding scale depending on the kind of usage in the library. So um, again, following kind of a site license model where it's like, okay, you have about this many students and therefore the, and you want to have a year license or a six month license, um, we kind of just work with them for customized solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, unfortunately, it's 515. So I would encourage you because this is uh, well. I think there are. I don't have a business plan. I know I'm getting there. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, uh, I think there are keynotes in the main uh, auditorium, but these guys can hang out here for a little while. Um, so if you have specific questions, I think come talk to them. But hold on, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. Um, okay, I'm going to try to simplify this, and I'm going to say let's let's give uh, Dan a direction here. I think there are three possible directions in terms of where he could focus his attention. He could focus his attention on 
selling direct to teachers in schools. That's his primary directive. That's mostly Robin's strategy, is we're going to serve the teacher, we're going to sell direct to teachers in schools. He could I'm either... Do that, by the way. I'm sorry? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of votes. You're going to do what they tell you to do. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, second option is... Just not a lot of robotics. We're not things. touching kid 12 with a 10-foot pole. Yeah. We're going to follow Noelle's example here. Say we're going to go direct to parents because they have more uh, wherewithal to be able to pay for this product, and they're all the benefits of reaching kids at home. Okay, so that's strategy number two. Strategy number three is to look at third spaces based on subject area. So rather than focus first on schools or first at home, look at robotics programs, look at libraries, look at maker programs, look at, go with a subject-driven distribution strategy. Is that fair? Does that, are those, yeah. those good options? Yeah. Okay, so number one, direct to teachers, number two, direct to parents, number three, third spaces. So let's see a show of hands. Who thinks number one, direct to teachers, should be Dan's primary focus as he moves forward? Wow, we really scared them about K-12. <laughs> if you're interested, come talk to I me know. afterwards. <laughs> I will help you. <laughs> well, it's clear he was not so interested in it. <laughs> okay, that was interesting. Number two, direct to parents. Go straight to home consumer market. Just bear in mind, this is middle school, high school, where parent purchasing agency to clean yeah. sharply. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> That's tough. Do you want the advice or not? Okay. So, number three, subject area focus. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sweet. All right, we have a winner. Yeah, <laughs> Stan is going to report back to all of us. We expect a quarterly update. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see how you do it. All Next right. year's game for change, when we will all be sitting here. Doing a post mortem. <laughs> <laughs>